Chapter 10, DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. This chapter we're going to focus on a lot of self-learning activities in class and you really are going to, going to need to be reading the textbook, interpreting the information, and asking me for help if you are not understanding what we are doing. We are going to be moving quickly in order to get done in time for the semester break. So the first section focuses on the history of how we discovered the molecule of DNA. Before we actually knew what DNA was, people believed in this blending concept that the offspring were a blend of the parents and some type of life force or, or essence was passed on from parents to children. It was found after several experiments that scientists were able to prove that DNA is the material in which parents do give to their children. So the first experiment we're going to talk about is Frederick Griffith's experiment. He was a physician and a bacteriologist. He was looking for a cure for pneumonia in soldiers. And what he observed was that there were two strains of pneumonia. These strains were based on their shape and how they presented themselves when put on a growth media. One was smooth, one was rough. The smooth pneumonia would, in fact, kill soldiers. It had a high um, mortality rate. It was more virulent than the pneumonia cells that had a rough appearance. So in the Griffiths experiment, he took the rough strain of bacteria, which is right here, and he injected that into the mouse, and the mouse lived. Then he took the smooth bacteria and put it in the mouse, and the mouse died. So the next thing he attempted to do was he took the, the virulent, the smooth strain of bacteria, and he heat killed it. So he exposed it to heat. And we've talked about how heat will denature proteins. And so that is most likely what happened. And he injected those denatured, you could say, bacterial cells now into the mouse and as expected, the mouse lived because, again, the proteins aren't going to work anymore. So his last experiment, he took two types of bacteria. He took the rough and the heat killed smooth. So he took this group, if I was to show you right here, this group right here, and this group right here, and you really wouldn't expect then if you mix them to get the mouse to die, but it did. And so that started to ask, you know, to bring up more questions. You know, why would I take two non-lethal strains of bacteria, one that is naturally non-lethal and one that I have denatured, and put them together and now they kill the mouse? So big questions here. So when the mouse died unexpectedly, Griffiths then took out some of the bacterial cells from the dead mouse and plated them and found that he only saw the living virulent strain, the smooth bacteria. So something had transformed the original rough bacteria into the virulent smooth bacteria, and he was suggesting that it was the DNA that had transformed it. So we know that bacteria can take in foreign material. Um, he was unsure whether it was DNA or protein. He was leading towards protein, but again, scientists, they need more proof. So Griffith's experiment was not enough to show that it was exactly um, the DNA that transformed the bacteria. Could it be the protein? So that was the question that was still being asked at the end of Griffith's experiment. DNA or protein? DNA or protein? One of those two things transformed that bacterial cell. It was Oswald Avery who then took Griffith's idea of 
the different types of bacterial cells, and he just took it one step further. He wanted to show, you know, he wanted to prove that DNA was, in fact, the transforming factor and not the protein. So Avery's experiment was kind of like a follow-up from Griffith's experiment. So what he did was he took that lethal bacteria strain, the, the smooth one, and he heat killed it. So that's what he did here. And then he selectively chose which biological macromolecule he wanted to keep and got rid of the rest. So in this one, he kept the lipids. He added it to the harmless bacteria and the mouse lived. And then he repeated that experiment and he kept the polysaccharides. But if you remember, polysaccharides are sugars. Put them in the harmless bacteria and the mouse lived. And then he did the same thing again. He got rid of all the other biological macromolecules and kept the proteins, put that in the mouse. Mouse still lived. And then he tried the nucleic acid. So he kept the nucleic acids, killed everything else, put it in with the harmless bacteria also, and then injected it into the mouse, and the mouse died. So what this experiment showed was the nucleic acids were responsible for transforming those smooth bacteria cells, the, the harmless, oop, not the smooth, sorry, let's go back with that. Um, so he transformed, let's try to erase that, there we go. He transformed the rough bacteria that were harmless, and he actually took blood out of the mouse, and when he replated them on a petri dish, they were actually smooth. And so that is the transforming factor, the nucleic acids. So like I just said, Avery, he proved it was the DNA, not the other macromolecules that are responsible for transforming the bacterial cells. However, many scientists still did not support this experiment and had questionable doubts that DNA transformed the bacteria. So those... On those scientists that are not easily convinced, we're still like, no, no, we're not sure it's the DNA. We still think it could be the proteins. So we still had scientists trying to prove that it was, in fact, the DNA that is what is passed on from parents to, to offspring. And that's what we're going to see next with Hershey and Chase. So Hershey and Chase, there are two scientists, and they actually experimented with bacteria and viruses that infect the bacteria. So viruses don't just infect humans, they also infect other organisms as well. So we're going to look at this virus that infects bacteria. The name of this type of virus is called a bacteriophage. So in order for Hershey and Chase's experiment to work, what they did was they had to use radioactive isotopes, and so they use these isotopes to label either the protein or the DNA. Now we can do that because sulfur is found, so we have our sulfur, it's found in amino acids, which as we have learned this year, are the building blocks for proteins. So they're going to tag proteins with a radioactive isotope called S35. The S represents the element, sulfur, the 35 represents the mass. And if you look up on the periodic table, you'll see that it's heavier than the average mass for sulfur. And because it's heavier, it means it has more neutrons, so it's unstable and gives off energy in the form of radiation. We can then use that radiation to identify different types of molecules to see if it's there or not there. Um, we can also use it to expose light to film in which we can get pictures of things as well. Now for the other biological macromolecule that we were trying to um, identify, that was DNA. Now in DNA we have phosphorus in that phosphate group, so we're going to use a different radioactive isotope to label the DNA. We're going to use P32. So again, P is the element, phosphorus 32 is the isotope's mass. So I think for students this is probably one of the hardest experiments that um, in, in, in the terms of understanding. Most students understand Griffith's experiment with the mice and, and Avery and it's 
the Hershey and Chase experiment that causes a little bit of difficulty. So let's start with just the sulfur. So that's on this side. Let's start with this one. Okay. So the outer, the structural support, what the, the structure of the virus, this is the virus, is made up of proteins. All right. So we already talked about how we can label proteins with S35. Now we know that viruses, the way they work is that they somehow put something into your cell. We didn't know at the time, but they put something into the cell and that instructs the cell to make more viral particles. And that's what we're trying to figure out. What is transforming this cell into a viral um, making machine? So what we first did in the first experiment was we took that S35 and we labeled the protein. So we labeled the outer structure of the virus. We gave the virus time to infect the bacterial cells and then they put it in a blender basically and so we blended it we put it in the blender mixed it all up and we shook off we tried to dislodge to shake up and separate the viral particle from the bacterial cell and then what we did next was they used a centrifuge and they spun it and now the way a centrifuge works is it separates things out based on density so at the bottom of the test tube, we would have this pellet of bacterial cells, and the virus would stay in the fluid. And so in this particular experiment, we noticed that the fluid was radioactive still, not the pellet. So whatever it stuck in there, it didn't stick the protein, because the protein stayed in the fluid. So then we tried the same experiment again. So we took a virus, and this time we labeled the DNA, which is inside the little head here of the virus. We again let it infect the bacterial cell and then we dislodged it with a blender and then we put it in a centrifuge and we spun it and then we again checked to see what was radioactive and what we found was the pellet was radioactive so where the bacterial cells were sitting and not the fluid. So this lab, this lab experiment, proved without a shadow of a doubt that DNA was the transforming factor. So the Hershey and Chase experiment proved that DNA was definitely the transforming factor. This then led to one of the biggest scientific quests, and that's called the race for the structure of DNA. And we will go into that in section 10.2.